Hello and welcome to my kitchen in Gloucestershire this Thursday afternoon, really sunny afternoon in the Cotswolds. And I'm very excited because we're going to be going south to Georgia, USA, to my friend James Farmer, the author, writer, cook, gardener, designer, party man. This is his book, one of his books, Dinner on the Grounds, which is, as you can see, very well used in my kitchen and huge inspiration for so many of my parties. I spent so much time in Atlanta and in Georgia and I haven't been since March last year. So I'm very excited to be taking a trip down south um, to introduce everyone to James, who I met at his, one of his book launches in 2015 and again in 2017. And um, we have an Insta friendship. I kind of stalk him and see all the things he's planting. He's a real plantsman. So I'm going to just request James that you join now. I see that um, there you are. And I am sending you to the call. And um, let's see. James, you should come live any second. And I'm really looking forward to... There you are, James. Hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm good, buddy. How about you? I'm really good. It's so great to see you and hear your voice and your beautiful Likewise. southern accent. <laughs> well, I love your accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I was just saying before you came on, it's so exciting for me because I've not been to Georgia since March last year, March, April last year. And you know, I spent so much time in Atlanta with our head office there. And yeah. um, I'm really excited to be going down south. Well, welcome y'all. <laughs> we say y'all, whether it's singular or a throng of people, but I'm glad <laughs> you're here. I'm glad you're here. I've had to come inside. It's hot, it's hot outside. And I, I thought I could be out in the garden and um, mm -mm, it's too hot. So <laughs> I was starting to wilt. <laughs> I'm so pleased to have you here uh, um, like, in my you. kitchen in Gloucestershire. James, I, I have been thumbing through again and the Dinner on the Grounds book. Um, I have two of your books, um, you. but Dinner on the Grounds is for me such an inspiring book because I have a lovely garden, um, or yard as you call it. Um, and just being able to see so many, so much inspiration, so many things that you can do and places that you can see the way you, where you put things and how you pull things together. What comes first for you, the, the event or the food or the design? Or, I know that it's ingrained in you. I know that as a little boy, you worked in people's gardens. It, it is, it is. Um, for, for me, honestly, the first inspiration is the season. Um, so whether it's like today is my, my middle sister's birthday Happy so, birthday, little sister. Yes, yes, yes. So um, we, you know, so I think about, you know, if we were all together, which we're just, we're not right, right, right this second, but when we are, you know, her birthday's in the middle of May, the hydrangeas start blooming, the strawberries are in season, uh, some of the first peaches are arriving. So I think about the season first off, and then if it's a birthday or some type of dinner, what is in season to prepare? And then honestly, I look to the garden for that inspiration as well. So uh, for me, uh, my, my fox gloves just finished, but I, I cut you know, the last ones um, to make an arrangement. Uh, a friend sent me these gorgeous peonies that we can't, we can't grow like those in the deep south, but you know, whatever it is in season, that becomes the inspiration. And then the food follows. And James, you are from the deep south, you're from Perry, which you call yeah. Perry Dice. Yeah. <laughs> and you went away to study, you went to Auburn. But before yeah. that, your grandfather was a big influence in your life. Absolutely. My, my really first, one of my first memories, but not just, not just memory, but garden memory as well. Uh, my granddaddy, we, granddaddy, Big Nap, um, he was a gardener. And uh, in the deep south, you know, we've, we grow flowers in the yard and vegetables in the garden. And this memory <laughs> of of granddaddy holding me in one arm and this and then he picked a tomato with the other and that smell of the tomato vine you know it's 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 a great scent i love i love the smell of a tomato vine and that scent you know is, is associated with memory but then furthermore you take that tomato inside and my grandmother made the best tomato sandwiches and so you would have that tomato 
not only have I smelled it and seen it, you know, in my granddaddy's arms, but then I taste it, you know, in, um, in, in my grandmother's kitchen and that lingering scent of, of bacon, you know, frying, because we, we do bacon and tomato sandwiches. And I just, I just think that that really instilled in me as a child, and it's still here today. You know, you, you, you talk in such a lovely romantic way. Is that a big part of your pursuit is to, is to bring it, uh, bring it, you've been, you've been known to say that you can grow it and eat it. Correct, um, correct. And that you want to inspire your generation, our generation to, to, to be the people who continue to do so. But was it that very romantic sort of scene of your grandparents in the vegetable garden that is something that you, is something you want to just perpetuate? It is, and um, I think that word romantic is so key to describe the South. We are, we're an imaginative people, and we're very celebratory with food, and you know, the first thing that we're going to ask you, you know, how are y'all doing? What, what, are you hungry? What can I feed you? But there is a romance associated with it because um, emotions and feelings and the general aesthetic of the table and how we entertain um, is, a, is just an extension. So anyone who's ever heard me, you know, give a talk or, um, or read any of my books, my grandmother taught me that we eat with our eyes first. So before you've had that first bite, you know, there's a visual consumption. And then she also told me that we feed people body and soul when they're at our table. So what's, what's just amazing about that is there is a romance to that. And, you know, romance isn't always between, you know, lovers or husbands or husbands and wives or however it is. Romance is a type of love and food is love for us in the South. And so your, your grandparents instilled that in you. And what turned you into a cook? Or do I need to go back to where you studied? Because you studied horticulture and, history, and art history. Yes. Which is so yes. sort of diametric. Well, they are diametric, but at the same time, um, they're related because uh, Auburn um, has a great design school. And so the horticulture and the art history are, are within those design schools. So and on one hand, I'm a licensed, accredited landscape designer. But on the other hand, I'm a licensed, accredited interior designer. And I love that I took the art history approach for design as well as the horticulture approach for design. You can you know, learn to draw circles on a piece of paper and that's a boxwood or a holly. But when you learn the horticulture, like what's the difference between those boxwoods and, and the art history of what was you know, Capability Brown doing um, in England you know, when he was working at High Clear or what was um, you know, Wren's designing when he was working on parliamentary buildings in London. You, know, you think about there's so much history involved. And um, I really wanted that, that aspect as opposed to just the, these two lines are a column and this circle is a boxwood. So, um, but the, the cook, so you know, besides professionally being a, a designer, uh, the cook part of me, I was just hungry. I wanted to eat. I loved <laughs> being in the kitchen. And um, my grandmother was an amazing cook, but it wasn't that it was fancy and elaborate, it's that it was just delicious, good food. But it was in particular at Auburn, my freshman year, I started cooking in the dorm kitchen. And I realized my generation did not know how to cook. And I thought, well, how do you learn how to cook? And this was, of course, before social media and so on and so forth. So the way to cook is you open a book and you follow the recipe. So that was the idea for the books, too. So I'm drinking. I see you're drinking hot tea. Yes. I've you're drinking iced tea, aren't you? you here. Yeah, it's just hot. I, you couldn't, couldn't be in Georgia without some iced tea. And I have exactly. to say, it's my sort of my secret thing I, that I, I love some sweet, some sweet iced tea. Me too. I, had, I have to watch it, though, because that's a lot of sugar intake. So anyway, so I'm drinking a, it's a peach green tea today. There you go. How wonderful. And James, you're, you, you moved back to Perry, which you call mm-hmm. Perry Nice, mm-hmm. which I mm-hmm. love. Um, <laughs> it's tongue in cheek. <laughs> I think it's a hash, hashtag all of its own. And yeah. it's in southwest Georgia. Yeah, it's, it's kind of south central Georgia. We're, we're right at that cusp. Um, it's a, there's, a, there's a great movie that I love called Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And it, there's a line that says, well, isn't this place a geographical oddity? And we, we are a, a geographical oddity because we're on the fall line. And the, the, the fall line um, is is a geographical watershed that separates water going to the Atlantic Ocean into the Gulf of Mexico. So in one end of our county, you can stand and the creeks or the rivers are running to the Atlantic. 
But on the other end of the county, they're running to the Gulf. And that really has uh, a geographical, um, not only does it give us nomenclature of, of, of our region, but it, it gives us the vernacular of what we can grow. And so, I, I, you know, tongue in cheek, just another day in paradise here in South Central Georgia. <laughs> and Jebs, you, you went home after university. So yes, yes. Other, other contemporaries of yours would have gone off to seek fame, fame and fortune in the big <laughs> city. You went home to seek fame and fortune. Um, and you've been quoted as saying you're the guy who, who just supports local, that everything yes. from like accounting and legal and all sorts of things. It's just, you know the people, it's, it's easy. The whole small town in oh, commerce, yeah. you know, just ma has made your life so much richer and easier. It has. Um, the analogy, you know, is, um, is, is in the South, we, we have, you know, we, and we do a lot of things towards animals and birds and, and, and creatures, you know, but I'm just a bird in my nest at home because I, I understand I can work here. But there's also something um, very, um, very rooted about still being in your hometown. You know, my, my parents, you know, my mother grew up here. My mother's side of the family are, are the ones who are from here. And so to have, you know, going back to my great grandparents all in the same county, it's it's very interesting. But you'll you'll see that there's a lot of similarities to to the Deep South and the British culture because one, we're a colony. <laughs> we y'all started this. <laughs> but what I love though is that it's 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 that familial. Um, well, you know, I may not be a doctor or a lawyer or a minister like like the men in my family have been. But I am still a professional um, in my hometown. And there's just something to be said about my banker and my attorney are my, they're my friends. We went to high school together or their wives work with me. And that is just something you can't get in a larger, in a larger city. And, um, and quite frankly, I'm just a small town country mouse. <laughs> and James, you have famously built a beautiful home. Thank you. It's, it's a happy house. And what was the inspiration and why build and not restore or? Well, to be honest, um, I wanted to restore an old home. Uh, that was, I, I felt like, um, and I don't know if, if, if y'all feel like this uh, with me, that our lives, they have chapters. You know, they have, well, this chapter of my life is this or what, or what have you. Um, I always knew that I would build a house. Uh, I live on my family land. My aunt and uncle live, you know, if you walk out that door. <laughs> You know, well, oh, okay. so you live together. Yeah, we all do live. Yeah, we live together. A lot of people don't understand that, but it's you know we're all we're all here together, and it's the same thing up in the mountains, up in Cashers. We're in the same neighborhood, but it works. So you know, when we're all together, you know, it's it it really helps. But the reason um, I ended up building on the land, um, there was there just wasn't the right old house chapter yet. You know, and you can't. You can't force that book to open if it's not if it's yeah. not there. So the opportunity came to build a house. I worked with a fabulous architect in Atlanta, Robert Norris, and it's just um, it's just a happy house. He took he took inspiration from um, it was a post office uh, that was on the farm where my grandfather grew up, actually in Alabama, and on that on that farm it was a little rural community outside of Mobile, but he would walk there with his mother and I have a painting, actually I can show you um, what the inspiration was. I'm gonna flip the camera around. Um, but here, this was where my grandfather would walk with his mother and they would walk down and get the mail or get something from the general store. But this stuck out in my mind that this is a, architecturally, this is very post and linear. You have a clipped hip you have a strong central gable and it had stairs either side. So that I took that inspiration to my architect and he said, James, you know, he broke down the architectural elements like that and said, this is, we can do this. And um, so. I love that. So it's reminiscent for you, even though it's new, which is so lovely. I, I use a lot of old materials. And of course I decorate with, you know, antiques and family pieces and, and it, you know, it's well seasoned. And James, when did you finish? I started the house in, I moved in. So this is my fifth year. Um, I moved in in the summer of 2015. And I, I think that it really takes that handful of years to, um, you know, for it to really be 
well, well seasoned. The best thing to do is move in and start entertaining, have people over, have friends over. And that, that builds the memories and that builds, it gives you excuses too. You know, if you say, oh, I want to paint this or build this or plant this. Sure, you can, but if you're having a party, there's an excuse for it. And um, that's why I like to entertain. It, it, it gives me a, a goal, that, that carrot to chase. And looking back now, I mean, you've got a, you've got a whole library of books that you've done. Um, it is, and it, it, it must have, in looking back, it's such an obvious progression for you. Was the first book terrifying? It wasn't terrifying to write. It was terrifying to, um, to get published because I was so young. I, I wrote the book in my 20s and I published it, um, I guess, eight years ago now. And what's, what's so fascinating about, about that part is I can write the book. That's not, that's not terrifying. But to have to pitch something that's from your heart that you've written and, you know, an editor in New York just red lines through it and says, you're too young, you know, no, no, thank you. Or you have recipes in this book, but it's about gardening and they don't, they just didn't understand it. And that was more so, um, that was more heartbreaking than anything because you're proud of what you've done and you know that it can help people and you know that it can, um, it can inspire people and educate, but then you know, that, that red line, that no thank you, you know, I had a dozen, you know, passes, no, before, um, before my publisher, who they're out on the West Coast said, let's, let's give it a try. And I said, well, for those who don't know, James's books are about living. Yes. I mean, they really are. They're about gardening and food and design and houses and interiors and flowers and tablescapes and china and mm -hmm. just all those really wonderful things that make up a really rich life. And by rich, I just mean full and, and sort of all embracing and encompassing. And entertaining is a very strong thread that runs through the book, as is, as is food. And um, so your first, your first book, was that about inspiring people? Was it about getting recipes out Truly. there? Was it about? Well, you know, for, for example, you know, I'm here, I'm, I want to inspire people that you can, you can enrich your life with the garden um, so simply. And, but what it does is it's a common thread that connects us to our parents and to our grandparents. You know, I have some, I'm, I'm about to pour some water here and the water has mint in it. The mint is from my garden. It's a single little terracotta pot because mint's so invasive, I like to grow it in a pot. But this glass of water, you know, it, it just looks like a plain glass of water. I mean, that mint, a little slice of lemon, and it, it's, it's absolutely fabulous. But I grew that mint, and that is a part of something greater because then I'm connected. So um, if I can inspire people to, to grow, whether it's little cut flowers for, uh, for your table setting, but also by your bedside. I love to keep flowers by my bed. It's the first and last thing that I see. I see the gorgeous lilies behind you. You know, flowers just say something. And if you can go out in your yard or your garden and cut them, more power to you. And James, tell me about the, the latest book. I'm so excited. It'll be out um, in August. It's called Arriving Home. And it's a, it's a interior design book. That is my day job. Um, but it's showcasing uh, homes from Connecticut to Alabama. 11 homes. 11 homes, yes. And they are across the, the East Coast of the US. And one thing that I'm so excited about it is that it's, 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 not just, um, it's not just pictures of a house. There's a big difference between house and home. And you know, home tugs on our heartstrings, home invokes the senses. So um, I feel like it's like an old South, um, a, a Southern tour of homes per se, you know, we, um, there's a saying down here, we, we're house proud. And it doesn't matter how grand your house is, or if it's a cottage in the woods, we're proud. And we love to have people over. And we love to open up our homes and have a home tour. So um, I feel like that's what this is, is that it's a home tour of, of these homes across, across the South and even up to New England. Yeah, I think the, the thread of hospitality has had such a huge impact on me. I know where I come from in South Africa, there's yeah. is that very strong sense of, of hospitality. And my, my, my business partnership happened because of a dinner. Literally, 
I was in it. I was coming to Atlanta, and I had met I had met Matthew before. And Matthew, you said, our friend Matthew, yeah. And Matthew said to me, "Well, you you should come for dinner." And I went to dinner, <laughs> and I sat next to Catherine. And Catherine said, "Where are you staying?" And I said, "We're at a hotel in Midtown or something." She, "Oh no, no, honey, you're going to move no, in tomorrow." No. Stay and, in us. and yeah. that 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 sense of hospitality was so so striking for me. Being on some sort of I was on a, on a six day four city tour, you know, and yeah. just to walk into somebody's home and be made to feel so at home and so welcome. It was very, it was very, very special. And I've experienced that right across the South. Um, Absolutely. Oh, well, first off, Matthew and Catherine are two of the best hosts and hostesses anywhere. They are. Um, I know Catherine's family um, up in the mountains and down, down on the Georgia coast as well. But Matthew and I became friends through the design community in Atlanta. But if you, I mean, just to be at their house or one of their parties, it, it is life changing. And as it is for you, you have, you have a business partner. Yeah, it was, it was really a fantastic, a, a fantastic introduction to, to the South. I mean, I'd seen, never seen so many silver, so many silver utensils. <laughs> they have because in England, we don't have, you know, strawberry forks and, oh, and all every, those sort of things. Everything. And Matthew loves the, the quirkier, the better. The uh, crazier, you know, the better. We, Strawberry for yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. When I stay there, I'm kind of like, can the taxi journey please not be in my bedroom? <laughs> um, but the the James the the whole thing of, of 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 hospitality and bringing that into your design, you must you must really inspire your clients to live in a certain way and to experience life in a certain way, and I think that is. That is something that's, that's such a gift to be able to give to give to people to say, you know, you're going to have this lovely home, but actually this is how you're going to use it. Thank you. Well, you know, and help them conceptualize their events. So I imagine when people come to you for an event, mm -hmm. they come to you with pretty much not a huge amount of idea of exactly what they want. And they let you think about it and think about it. it. How does that work for for, for me, the event also goes back to, you know, even a dinner or a birthday, it goes to the season. So let's say it's uh, a fundraiser for like, I'm on a, a garden board here in Georgia and we have uh, the first weekend in May is usually our big ball. So when I planned that event, I thought about, you know, a garden party and the inspiration actually was, was New Orleans. And I thought about how, you know, that encompasses food and flowers and just a whole, uh, a whole elegant but yet really fun way to entertain. So that that's a big part for me with with an event. Um, my sister's wedding was this fall, and that whole inspiration came from um, emphasis on there's a marriage after a wedding. You know, so a lot of people go, and that's awesome if you want to go over the top with a wedding. But for us, it was about friends, it was about family, about being in the garden. And so that being fall in Georgia, you know, we have the leaves turning, so on and so forth. But it was more so about the celebration of being together. And it, it allowed my, my garden to be a great backdrop. I feel like as, um, as interior designers, we are like the stage, the stage decorators, the stage designers, you know, the people who set a scene. And then we let our clients, their lives, you know, um, shine because of that so you know i love um like at christmas time when i get pictures from clients and i see the kids or see them pose and i'm thinking yeah i selected that wallpaper right behind you <laughs> but and you also, must have sometimes that moment when you've done a, you know you've done a whole lot of christmas trees for someone um, yeah. for a range of clients and you get home and you haven't even done a thing for yourself oh, yet i can be a, i honestly can be a scrooge at christmas because by the time i've done <laughs> Anyways, that that's that. But I love, in particular, being able to set the set the stage for my clients. Um, yeah, for their for their settings, you know, for their lives. And if there was a young man coming through, or a young woman coming through, and wanting to study horticulture, mm -hmm. because I mean, you know, there's lots of advice you can give people to study design. But if they were going to study horticulture and plants mm -hmm. and 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 gardening, what would your advice be? To First off, get a passion for it get your hands dirty just try it just try it my grandmother um used to used to say it's just paint you know meaning like if you want to try it just try it. it's just paint you know it's just dirt it's just a flower it's just plant it just try it you know maybe not start on um you know japanese bonsai right at first you know something that takes a lot of patience and skill um but herbs are one of those great things because you can plant herbs in a terracotta pot 
and good potting soil. You can get all of this, you know, at the nursery or the hardware store, places like that, and put it in there, put it in a sunny spot, water it a couple times a week. And the next thing you know, you've got mint that you can put in your tea or your ice water. And it's when you get that connection that you grew that mint and put it in your tea. I mean, that's when you get hooked. Just try it. It's just, it's just dirt. Just try it. <laughs> and, and James, if you, if you could grow, grow one thing, Mm. That you can't, that doesn't grow in the south. Oh, would it okay. Be? It's a great Because your climates are quite harsh. It gets very cold, it, lots of frost. It's very humid. It is. It is. The, the heat is the worst thing because it's coupled with humidity. And, and what that does is it gives us this, you know, from about May to October, this, you know, this really intense time where you're hot and it's sultry and humid and you can grow so many things. So embrace that and, and grow those, you know, semi-tropical things like that, like bougainvillea and plumbago and palms. But the things that I, that I just can't grow here, I'm, I'm about to start experimenting with up in, the, up in the mountains. And so I love the, it's the tender little perennials that, that you see in English gardens, things like um, like little creeping geraniums, little scented geraniums, the, um, the foxgloves and the digitalis that come back just stronger in you every year. But I also love if I could just grow English garden roses. You know, they, the, the scent is so heady and beautiful. And if I could just, you know, clip those and put them in a silver vase, but there's no way I could do that in South Central Georgia. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, I spent the weekend planting roses. I know all about English. Oh, English I'm roses. so jealous. You have to send me pictures. Oh. Everybody says, you know, about roses in England, you can just, you know, you just put them in the soil and they'll grow. You don't really have to do anything too special. Um, so we, we have a quite a big rose garden. And um, some years we have not such great roses. And some years we have <laughs> wonderful roses. Um, and... Where, where, what's next? Where, where's next? When this is all over this and you can move around more freely, where next? I'm going to go up to the mountains. I'm going to spend some time up there. I, I have been going back and forth um, up to Cashers, North Carolina, which is where my family has been going for, you know, my grandparents started going and my parents took us, my aunt and uncle, you know, we're just, we love being there. Very, me, very beautiful. It is. It is beautiful. It is. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you, you've been there. And it's, it, it, it's a lot of people say that it's very almost like the Welsh, you know, countryside that it's sweeping. You have mountain views or there's there are a lot of Scottish, you know, folks up there, too. But what I love in particular about Cashers is that within a few hours, I'm in a totally different place. You know, I can grow things that I can't grow there. I have friends there that I don't have, you know, in, at home. I love my I love my church up there. It's it, you know this is little Episcopal church right on the grounds of High Hampton. Um, so for me, traveling isn't going to Bora Bora. You know I, that's um, that's amazing if you want to go you know swim swim with dolphins and whales in the Pacific or something. But I just like within a few hours I can be in my car and then be somewhere completely different. And um, and that that is where I hope to be for a couple weeks in June, at least, to get kind of get the garden set up and open up the house for summer. That's been a really interesting experience of, um, of, of the South, is that you can, from Atlanta, you can be at the sea in five hours. Yes. And then in a few hours, in a few hours, you could be, we were up to Cashers. Um, I took my mother up to Cashers, and it was, it was so spectacularly beautiful. And I had no idea. I mean, you read about, you know, the mountains in, in the U.S., and mm -hmm. we'd just been to the Grand Canyon as well, which was a whole right. different, a completely different set of mountains. Completely different. And so we did this whole sort of trip across the, um, we, we went literally from the canyon to Charleston and Savannah. Oh. And it was so diverse and, and so wonderful. But Cassius was breathtaking. Because you just go steeper and steeper and steeper, and then you stop, and it's, you just run up in the clouds. It's really wonderful. You really are. You're up in um, one of the highest elevations on the East Coast. And, you know, from there are a couple places where you can see Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, all you know, these four states right there. But you have, um, there in particular, you have four really strong seasons. And so in the, in the deep south, you know, we're hot and then not as hot. You know, our winter um, isn't, as, isn't as severe. So it's chilly, but it's not, um, it's not unbearable. But up there, you get snow, you get ice, you can see, you know, icicles hanging from the rocks. But it's actually a beautiful time, too. So 
that's that's just fun for me. And, and like you mentioned, the sea, the coast, the Georgia coast, and up to the Carolina coast, it's it's really pretty too. So um, I'm gonna get to go down there um, hopefully this this summer. I, I I can feel I can feel the the want to walk on the beach, and so I'm I'm just gonna have to give in sometime this summer. So you're a local boy. You like you like being out of home in yeah in, in your home, on your home on your home soil. And mm -hmm. James, if you are at home. And it's not a big event, and and you're just cooking a meal mm -hmm. for one or two people. Or you're just your sister's coming around for dinner yeah. or something. What are you cooking? Breakfast for supper. I love breakfast for supper. I don't I don't get up and cook a big breakfast. I really don't. I don't really eat until about. I have a funny eating schedule because I I, I kind of go. You know, coffee kind of keeps me going, and then about you know about one thirty two o'clock, I'm thinking, oh, I'm hungry. But what I'm really hungry for is, you know, we, you know, we say it like a supper, you know, for, and so I love breakfast for supper, breakfast for dinner. Dinner has a little more of a um, celebratory term in the South or it's special, like it's your birthday dinner or your, or Sunday dinner or Christmas dinner, but supper is what we eat you know, every night. So for me, eggs and grits and biscuits and you know, Biscuits for us, cookies for y'all, you know. Um, but I love just that breakfast for supper. Um, but you can also spice it up too. To me, though, it's the it's the ultimate um, ultimate comfort food. And um, they're different grits. Is a whole different world for me because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but they're different ways of preparing grits. I believe and people have shrimp and grits, and people have. I mean, it's just a whole. As I said, in a whole other world. For you, how do you do your grits? So. You mentioned shrimp and grits. That's one of my absolute, absolute favorites. I can just hear my grandmother saying, we're going to have shrimp for supper. And I just, I, you just know that it's shrimp and grits. Um, <laughs> what I love about, about grits is Just that, explain to the people who don't know what grits okay. are. <laughs> grits are, are corn. Uh, they're ground corn. And it's, it's really before it's ground, it, it, it's granular. You know, it has um, very little, uh, has very little flavor itself, but it's a great conduit for flavor. So um, for me, I, you have to boil it in salt water and that kind of brings out that grainy texture and taste. And you boil it in salt water, maybe a little bit of chicken stock just to kind of give it that little flavor boost. But then um, for me, it's just about butter, salt and pepper and lots of black pepper, just enough salt to kind of bring out that grainy texture and then, and then good butter. From that, you can add. So um, I'm neither going to confirm nor deny, but cream cheese, that's it. That's the secret to good grits because it gives you the cream and it gives you that cheesy flavor. And you mix it up with, with over easy eggs and, some, and you scoop it up with some crispy bacon. It's good stuff. Well, wonderful. I think now I'm hungry, Justin. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask Catherine to make some grits because, I mean, there, there's been grits before and I've gone, I'll just, you know, skip that because I wasn't always quite sure about I'll make you some grits sometime and you'll you'll love them fantastic fantastic and how often do you do you get to to socialize I mean obviously your aunt and uncle live next door but mm -hmm. how far is your sister so one sister lives in town so she one's a photographer one's a yeah and they they both are photographers but in but one in particular is pursuing it more so for her career so my baby sister Meredith and her husband Keaton live in in town in Perry only about eight minutes, so it, you, nothing's <laughs> nothing's far here. Um, so we see each other very regularly. And then my uh, middle sister, she lives on the South Carolina coast in a beautiful little town called Bluffton. And she's the one who has my niece and nephew, who I just adore. And um, anyways, we see each other as much as we can. You know, the circumstances of late are different, but we're a very close family. And, um, and then my my first cousins are are we were all raised together like siblings. So um, we're we're you meet one of us, you meet us all. <laughs> yeah, I come from one of those kind of families. I know you know, they say yeah. characters are wonderful in other people's families, um, and it's it's wonderful because people 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 who come from those kind of families like I do, they we you move as a you move as a pack. Yes, you know, yes. It's, it's tribe, tribe mentality. James, how has this whole Corona lockdown affected a small town like, like Perry? Like Perry, you know, there's a part of me that feels, um, that feels a little bit of a return to um, kind of how I grew up. Um, downtown is where my office is and we have a, uh, a street downtown where um, 
all the shops and, and some local businesses are, it's not on a square like many towns. It's just a, it's kind of a, a single street. Um, but for a while you saw that um, it was kind of empty and it, you know, growing up, you know, downtown is where we went, you know, whether we're buying some back to school clothes or we were buying, um, you know, a gift for Mother's Day, you know, it was, it was your destination. And um, when, when downtown started kind of reopening a little bit, you saw that return um, of, of people coming and it, it really gave me that sense of this is so neat that I'm, I'm going downtown to my office where I work with my, with my staff. Uh, we've all been working from home, but when I, I go downtown to check the mail and, you know, to, to see what packages have come in and it gives me that sense of nostalgia that it kind of feels a little bit like, like when I was growing up, because growing up, you, you went to town, you know, whether it's to the post office or, or to church or to a business or whatever, but it gives this just kind of like nostalgic kind of tug at, you know, my heart thinking, I think we're going to be fine because downtown is, is steady. It stays there. It's that presence. It, you know, it's just one of those places where you kind of, you go to for work or whatever it is. And um, I think the effect uh, on Perry isn't, isn't necessarily um, visual per se, because you see people out and about if they're going to the grocery or going somewhere to pick up food, which is the main thing. So um, I, I'm really excited to see how, um, how we embrace um Kind of that return to maybe a touch of a slower pace, just a touch. And uh, I know, I know. Quite frankly, I'm I'm enjoying a slower pace. James, you uh, you have a a coterie of beautiful young ladies who work for you. <laughs> um, and they're if your they're smart. To do, if your uh, website yeah, has anything to be believed, they are. Well, they look like these absolute southern bells, and I'm sure that's not a prerequisite for for the job. But tell us about your team structure. How do you how do you structure yeah. your because you're well, such a multifaceted practice. We are. Um, so our my business is really divided into into twofold. Um, there's the interior design business, and so there's the I, I call that the front of house, and the de, the design business is the uh, it's the lion's share of the business. You know, and that design team. Um, I have I have four I have two designers I have a lead designer our associate designer and two project managers and then me so you know any any day I'm wearing a different hat in the office you know it's am I an interior designer or then the back of house is where we get into um, books speaking engagements you know um, entertaining things and so that back of the house is where um, you know things like you know scheduling a trip to Texas where I'm speaking in. Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio or something. And that, even though that's not design proper, I'm going to speak on design. I'm going to sell my design books. And so that becomes, um, it, it's related. So it's back of house is kind of the speaking and book sales, front of house is interior design. And then of course we have the all stars, which are our clerical you know, part of things where uh, a business manager and an office manager and um, a CFO who, you know, it is a business. And so um, I think a lot of designers don't, um, at least in, in school, don't, aren't, aren't taught this or instructed this, that whether it's, you know, if you're a lawyer or an accountant or a doctor, whatever kind of profession you are, you still are running a business and there's money to be made, money to be spent, money to be accounted for. So I have a, I have a strong team in that regard too, because you, you know, you have to have, um, you have to have that represented as well. So I really- It always amazes me, the lack of, pro of professional practice that is taught in design college. It I'm really always is. absolutely amazed. It, is, it, it truly is amazing because um, a, lot of, a lot of interior designers, and this is talking shop and business here, a lot of interior designers, you know, they, they're working with extraordinarily wealthy people. And those people um, who, who have that wealth and are able to spend it on interior design, um, they, they're, they're entrusting you as a service. Well, at the end of the day, when you go home, you know, you, you may not can put the Gournay wallpaper in your dining room like you can a client's. And so a lot of interior designers, um, they, they try to run, you know, run in the same circle per se as their clients. And that can be a slippery slope. And what I love to encourage people um, is that the business side of design um, that's where you can hire your weakness. You know, as a designer, pick out those fabulous colors, 
work with those great clients, have a, a wonderful, wonderful sense of relationship um, and, and communication, but don't hire a designer as your business manager. Hire a smart accountant and who, who may not know the difference between you know, Schumacher and Brunswick. However, they know how to put that into QuickBooks, and that is important. Yes, never true, never true word. And um, Chris, who um, is watching, who works with me, when you said every day is a different hat, and we're like that too, because we're a small team and it's a multidisciplinary yeah. practice. We do interior design, we do projects and fabrics and furniture and all sorts of things. And every day it's a different, and it keeps it exciting. It, you know, does. It's been, it does. It's been really hard working remotely and, um, you know, not everybody is working. And, you know, it's, it's been really hard because we had a bit of a drinks party yesterday on Zoom with the, with the team because we kind of all miss each other, which is, we which is for me really lovely because it's a really great crowd of people. You yeah, know, and there are nine of there are nine of us, and um, it it there's just something to be said about the camaraderie. You know, I keep reading these articles about, you know, do we need offices anymore? Do we need staffs? And you know, I'm thinking, you know, that's the time. You know, I may pick out a floral and a plaid and an animal print, and sure, I can I can select that, but it's going back and forth with my design team. And you know, oh, well, did you see this colorway? Or did you see, oh, oh I saw on Instagram um, how Justin used this gorgeous piece. You know, it, it's that inspiration, that camaraderie. And that's what, that's what we are, um, are challenged to do and, and getting tasked to do by our clients to create those, those beautiful collaborations. And um, so I miss, I miss my team. I don't know if they miss me, but I miss them. <laughs> yeah, I, I find, I mean, creativity doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And... I think yes. I think that bouncing ideas is really important. And we we we, use, we have this thing where you do sort of okay, we're going to do a new collection of furniture, so we'll do twenty sketches, and then it goes around, and everybody puts this. All the design people put their sketches in, and then it goes to the admin people and the sales people and the mm -hmm. you know people from dis and, and the marketing people, and they put their comments on the bottom, and sometimes you've got to go. Oh, I really loved that, but nobody <laughs> liked it, or like the sales guy will write. I can never sell that, you know, or, yeah. or I could sell that every day. And then you know that, you know that there's a different perspective that you're pulling in all the time. You get that from the collaboration and the, the teamwork from bouncing ideas and pulling yes. things around. And that's really, really important to people. And I think the other thing is the, the social aspect of work yes. has come to the fore in this, in, 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 during this whole lockdown period, because it's so much a part of the, of the tapestry of our lives every day, the people you interact with and the people you share things with and the how's your weekend and, you know, who do you fancy at work or mm -hmm. um, who don't you fancy at work or um, in the next door office or the, you know, the, the, the you know, the, 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 you know, there's a whole societal impact that, that has suddenly just been removed. And really? I think it's amazing to, to have a, to have a lovely, workspace where people feel safe, where people feel valued and, 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 and also that they can feel that they can give, put their input in. You're, and I think what I try right. to make my, yeah. my team really understand is that you can't do it alone. Mm -mm. No, no, you can't. And no man, no man is an island. And um, I've joked about that because I say, there's a part of me that really is an introvert when I'm writing, you know, when I need to just kind of decompress. But I always say, you know, no man is an island, but I'm kind of a peninsula. So, you know, it's like, I still need to be connected to that mainland. Um, but um, you are exactly right. Our office is in an old building downtown. And one of the things that we try to do is to make it, you know, feel homey. You know, we have lovely furniture there. We have, you know, accommodating things, but at the same time, it's a place of work. And I love that I can, within, within eight minutes, I can be home or in my office. And I can, you know, at home, I don't want to strew all the fabric samples and finished samples and things across my dining room table. It, I like my dining room table to be, you know, tidy, you know, I like it to be that. But at the same time, when I go to the office, I can then jump into that creative mode and, and pull the, um, you know, pull the fabrics and the sketches. And we have a big whiteboard that we can kind of draw and, you know, and, and it's, it's that feeding off one of each other, that, that camaraderie that really inspires great design. And James, there are a couple of things I have to ask you, and I've been, yeah. I, they're not all my own questions, just so, okay. just so you yeah. know. Um, 
Favorite sandwich we've covered, because that was a mm. question. So it's um, tomato and bacon sandwich, is that right? It, that's definitely one of them. I do love a cucumber sandwich, you know, thinly sliced cucumber, but it's, um, I like cucumber that's been soaking in vinegar, you know, so it has a little bit of that, that, that vinegary bite. So it's cucumber and a little bit of cream cheese. And so I do, and those are both good garden, good garden sandwiches. And your favorite meal is breakfast for dinner. So we've covered that. Yeah. Fa yeah. Um, floral or plaid? Uh, it's probably a hydrangea. Um, I love hydrangeas. Um, you'll, you'll appreciate this, Justin, you know, with, with your South African heritage and roots and then working in England. I had an aunt who was British. My uncle, my great uncle met her um, World War II. He was stationed in Dover and she came back to Georgia to, um, and so I grew up, you know, with this, with this British aunt who said, who said Pitosporum instead of Pitosporum or Aspidistra instead of Aspidistra. But the way she said, she would say hydrangea, hydrangea. And I, oh, I loved it. So to answer your question, it would be hydrangea. And um, there's so many varieties, you know, from limelight to endless summer to oak leaf and Annabelle. And you can plant all these hydrangeas and have color all summer and into fall. So that's my favorite uh, floral. Yeah, they're wonderful hydrangeas. They really are wonderful. Um, they, they grow so beautifully here because it's, we, our garden's quite cold so, um, and quite wet. I mean, everywhere in England's rather wet. So, yeah. so, yeah. so, 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 so they grow really well. And for my wedding, we had um, little hydrangea pots in big arrangements and then we planted them and we've got the sort of white hydrangea garden that, and so it's a reminder um, that that's really really pretty Alistair, i love that but where i where i grew up they grow hydrangeas grow very well at the sea and where i grew up um in there's a place called hermanus and the hydrangeas are probably taller than i am i mean you you're, you're tall like i am and and you're taller than me, which is remarkable. No one's ever. And sort of two meters tall, and the hydrangeas are, are taller than I am. They're, and they're these wonderful sort of queen mother hats. I used to think of them as, you know, the, uh -huh. these sort of big, big sort of purple or pink, pink um, hydrangea heads. And James, um, so the other the other question: favorite color to decorate with? Who? Oh, um, okay, so this is a tough a tough question because it's not it's not exactly a color. My favorite. My favorite colors are are really uncolors. They're not really they're not really green. They're not really blue. They're somewhere in between. Um, for an accent, you know, my mother's favorite color was Carl or Coral, um, and so I love that as an accent because because Carl really looks gorgeous with blue and white. But if I'm really going to stick to one color and one family and one shade in particular, it's going to be the greens. I love green because it it just quite frankly it can be very moody in a very good way. It can be light and springy. It can be, you know, more grayish and have more, um, you know, more shadow to it. But um, there's um, a color um, from Pharaoh and Ball that I love. It's it's caulk green and it's just lovely. Is it green? Is it blue? You know what? And and, and that's mm -hmm. it becomes conversation. I mean, look behind me. Just all the different shades of green. Um, and is there a color you don't use or don't relate to? Or. Um, Red, I have, a, I have a hard time with red um, because it is so seasonal for us in the deep south. You know, Nandina berries, holly berries. Uh, we use a lot of red poinsettia, red amaryllis. So I, you know. Again, you're getting so seasonal. And so it, for me, I love red, you know, in November and December and January. You know, I love red, but it, it's hard to think about it. However, um, a red geranium in the summertime is just spectacular. So. I wouldn't necessarily paint a wall red, but I would definitely use red as an accent, whether it's underground in a rug or underfoot in a rug or, you know, it's a flower. Um, to me, red is a challenging color for me. I, I appreciate it and I like it, but um, I'm a little bit of afraid because red, red, red's a strong, is a lion of a beast of a color. And so I don't know how to really tame it. It's fascinating. Um, it's, I always find it wonderful to know how what colors designers relate to because they're colors that I have such a tough time with. And, um, and I always love to know how people, how yeah. other people respond to, to, to colors. And what's next for you after the book? After the book, I have a little bit of um, a book tour. Uh, we've got some fun announcements coming up um, in, I think we're gonna start announcing in early June. Um, 
we just want to play it safe. You know, we had some spring events that we needed to move to the fall. And of course, we're keeping, you know, happiness and health of everyone um, first and foremost in line. But long story short, um, I'm planning the launch of my new book. So we're, we're working on that. And then I'll be going to a few places for speaking engagements. I'm not going to do a wild and crazy book tour. You know, it's just, I, I don't, I, I physically don't, don't feel up to it. You know, that's, um, I want to do more purposed, um, engagements and, uh, we'll, we'll work on that. I am going to England in 2021 and I was you supposed to be coming now. I was supposed to be there now. I was, and um, I'm gonna. So the trip, my my dear friend Mary, uh, she has planned this amazing trip with a group of with a group of folks to to tour um, to tour gardens, to tour homes. Um, I, I I really I told her I said my dream trip to England would be to, you know, to tour gardens, tour homes, look at antiques, have tea with friends like that. That is that is that is it. So. Someone's having to back up the camera. Um, long story short, um, I have just some travel coming up after the book, and then England um, in May, uh, April or May next year, and we'll see. Spring's how a really special time here. It is. It is. Mm. And it's amazing, amazing gardens you'll go to. Um, I can't wait. Yeah, I think you'll have an awesome time. Um, so I had, I was chatting last week with. Um, Robbie Honey, who's a horticulturist who lives in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. who, who practices and teaches. And he was saying that one garden that you have to go to is Great Dexter. Okay. So if you've not been to Great Dexter, you've got to give it to Mary and put that on your list. He says that's the one he takes everybody to. And it's just really? so okay. I love knowing that. I think that's yeah. fantastic. Well, we can't wait to see you, but I'll probably see you before that. Hopefully in September, I'll be in, I'll be in, okay. I'll be in Georgia again. Um, oh, good. But who knows? Who knows at this rate where, where we'll be? But it's, we're going to run out of time any second. So, James, it's been so lovely chatting to you. Thank you for sharing that about your team and about your, um, your, your grandparents. I find that so wonderful and so inspiring. I'm so flattered that you thought of me, and thank you so much for the opportunity. It's a total pleasure. And good luck with the book launch. And um, I'll have to add it to my collection of... I gave you a book. Um, which one? Celebrate? Uh huh. Uh huh. I think so. The time to celebrate, I gave to my cousin who okay. you'll be pleased to, as a wedding gift, part of oh, their I wedding love gift. That. Um, I love that. And they own the southernmost farm in Africa and they do have these amazing grounds. So uh, I don't know how, how, how much they are entertaining, um, we're particularly not at the moment, but um, you'll be pleased to know that some of your southern cuisine is probably being made at the southern tip of Africa. That, so, is, um, I, that, that just makes my heart smile. Thank spreading you. it all far and wide. Thank um, you. So, well, I can't wait to send you the new book and your mama and Alistair. Give everyone my, my love and I can't wait to see y'all for, for real. But this is so fun to connect. Thank you, James. Take care. Lots of love. Likewise. Bye-bye. Bye. So, everybody, that was James Farmer from the South. Dinner in the Grounds is the book I've got. New book is coming out called um, Welcome Home. Goodness, what do you say? Um, a place to call home. Um, but that was really fun and lovely to speak to James and to hear about life in paradise, as he calls it, which is so lovely. So thanks for tuning in. We will be back on, I will be back on Tuesday in my kitchen, um, which is going to be really fun again, as always, and really enjoying these sessions. They... They, they really break up the week, which is, which is lovely. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye.